won the Nobel Prize for constructing the following set of gambles that I'm going to ask you to look at. This is exactly what he did. Um, I will preface this by saying the following. Uh, that there are no right and wrong answers in this grid. There are simply choices that people make, and good economists want to be able to understand the choices that you make. Okay, that's all we want to do. Um, and we want to see if, if uh, these gambles will generate a preference reversal right here in this classroom. That's what the interesting thing would be. So here's what I'm asking you to do with your notes. Um, consider gamble one. There's two options. We have option one where you get the guaranteed million dollars, you win it 100% of the time, so it's yours. Or if you don't really like that, you can choose option two, where you win a million dollars 89% of the time, five million dollars 10% of the time, and then there's one chance out of 100 that you get nothing, right? There's no right or wrong answer here, just jot down which of these most appeals to you. Just put a one or a two somewhere in your notes, it will be a good shape. Okay. And he said, well, if I'm going to figure this out, I need to give them another gamble. And so we did. He constructed another gamble. And again, what you want to choose here, put your notes, is either the three or the four. And there's no right or wrong answer. You just need to make sure you understand what the gambles are. Gamble three is you've got an 11% chance of winning a million dollars, but an 89% chance of nothing. So you're more likely to get nothing than anything. And then in gamble four, you have a 10% chance of five million and a 90% chance of nothing. And there's no right or wrong answer here, just whichever one of these you happen to like, the three or the four. Just jot it down in your notes. Everybody got uh, two numbers there? OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the document camera. And I'm just going to find out who's where. So how many of you put down one and three? Four. All right. How many of you put down one and four? Twenty-four. How many of you put down two and three? Six. And how many of you put down two and four? met what we would think of as a rationality criteria. Okay, so I'm going to go back and remind you here. So we got most people on two and four. Uh, we have a number of people on one and four, and then just a couple of others in the different spots. So let's go back to the grid and look and see what we get. I'm going to start with the one and the three. All right, so it turns out that an economist who uh, you know, was just thinking about this would say that one and three makes perfect sense. Here's why. If your goal is to try to make sure you win something, then one gives you the best chance of winning something because there's this one in 100 chance that you might not get anything here. And if you're looking at the best chance of winning something, you could choose three here as well because uh, there's an 11% chance of winning here and only a 10% chance there. So anybody that went one in three, the economist would immediately look at this and say, okay, I get it. If somebody chose one, then it seems to me it's internally consistent that they would then choose Three, all right, in the next round, right? So that would be what you'd expect them to choose. And likewise, a bunch of you chose two and four, right? Well, why are you picking two and four? I think it's partly because you're looking at this from a gamble standpoint. You're saying, which of these is the best bet, right? And so the expected value here is higher for the second gamble than the first. Here you always win a million, but because there's a 10% chance of getting five million in addition to that, and only a 1% chance of getting nothing, the overall average here would be higher than it would be here. And so therefore you're saying, I like two, it's a better bet. And guess what? I like four because four is a better bet than three, right? Because you have a 10% chance of five million, and that's more money than an 11% chance of one million. So the economist goes, hey, two and four, I get it, no problem, right? But then we had a bunch of you who said what? 
we had the 1 and the 4. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right, and on the surface, because there's the 1, which is the sure thing, and then there's the riskier thing right here. So if we were thinking about risk tolerances, it looks like the choice of 1 and 4 is a preference reversal the same way there would be a 2 and a 3. There's just more of you on the, the 1 and the 4, okay? So there's two possible sources of, uh, of uh, preference reversal. And so Marisa Lay said, I can explain why that's the case. And so he tells us, let's figure out the LA paradox. So the first thing we're going to do is figure out the expected values for each of the gambles. So I'm just going to go back through this and uh, switch over to the document camera. And so we have the expected value of option number one. Well, option number one was you win a million dollars 100% of the time. All right? So, so that's easy. That would be one million times 100%. Of course, 100% is just one. And so that's just one million. And then we've got the expected value of gamble two which is you get the 1,089% of the time, 0.89, plus the 5,010% of the time. And so that's 890,000 right here, and that's half a million there, and that's 1.39 million in total. So the better bet is the second gamble than the first. And then what he does, he calls that set of gambles number one. And then he says, okay, let's compare that with what happens with the second set of gambles. And let's look at the expected values for the third option. For the third option, there was a 11% chance of 1 million. So that's just 0.11 million. And for the fourth gamble, there was $5 million that you got 10% of the time. And that's just half a million. All right, so what he's done has constructed two different gambles, but he's a really good economist. And so what he did was, I want to keep as much constant as possible. And so he did this in a clever way, because you'll notice here that when we get 1 million here and we get 1.39 million there, but the difference is 0.39 million. And then when you do the same thing down here, you'll notice that there's 0.11 million and 0.50 million, and the difference there is also 0.39 million. So he kept the differences the same, which is cool, which means that he was trying to hold lots of things constant so he can make a fair comparison. So he's not expecting anyone to want to switch from one to four, right? So we have a bunch of people switching right here, and he's thinking, why would you do that? Because even if you were looking at the expected values, it's not like, this is, this is always the same, it's, you know, almost 400,000 more in either case. You, if you want security, you choose security. But, but what he finds out is, that's not the way people think about it. People don't think of it that way. People instead go, oh, I know what's happening here. And they look at the gamble the following way. Right? We see the preference reversals, but he explains those preference reversals by thinking about relative wealth. All right, so here's the idea. In the first gamble, you get the guaranteed million dollars as one of your options. Some people are going to feel really bad. They choose option two, and they're the one person out of the hundred who gets stuck with nothing. Right? Their opportunity cost in that case is a million dollars. They're just going to feel like, man, I am so stupid. Right? And that's exactly what happens in real life when people amass um, fortunes that grow pretty large. It is they buy lots of health insurance, they buy better uh, health insurance, they insure their homes and their cars. And you buy the insurance against some unusual outcome occurring. So wealthy people can afford the insurance. You might choose to buy the insurance and choose option one. But that's not what a person who's choosing between options three and four is doing. If you're choosing between three and four, what do you expect to have happen if, you're, if your gamble is three or four? <coughs> Nothing, right? More often than not, you get zero. There's a small chance you might get a million, and there's a, even a slightly smaller chance you might get five million. So that's very much like playing the lottery. And by the way, all the statistics about uh, individuals gambling and playing the lottery and games of chance is it's overwhelmingly poor individuals who play these games of chance. And, and when they decide to play and put down two dollars here or five dollars there, as long as you're in, well then what makes it really exciting to you? As long as you're, it's going to be your lucky day, 
you don't want to just win a million. You want to win five million. Or this week's, you know, mega lottery is 244 million, right? That could change my life, right? And so if you're somebody who's down and out, then the idea is that you have less to lose and it might make you more of a risk taker. So what Alay says is, I understand. It's not that people are different. It's the same person in two different circumstances. One circumstance tells me I should take a chance. And as long as I'm taking a chance, well, the five million sounds a whole lot better than the one million. So I'm going to do the smart thing and go ahead and gamble. But then once you tell me I've got a sure million dollars, that would be crazy to lose that on a one in 100 chance of something bad happening. So I'm just going to lock in my gates. All right. So that's the same person reacting to the differences in wealth that they feel in the first option versus the second. He's able to explain that. He wins the Nobel Prize. It's all very cool. All right, so that's, that's the idea. OK. I want to give you guys an opportunity to uh, gamble here today uh, on your own. It's your turn to gamble uh, with participation points. So the idea here is uh, that you can select. You want to select an outcome for gamble one and gamble two. And you want to put this all on a sheet of paper. So I need your name. And then I need your choice for gamble one and your choice for gamble two. And you are welcome to chat about this with the people around you. But each person must submit their own separate sheet of paper because each of you has your own risk tolerance. And that's what we're trying to measure. You want an answer for gamble one and gamble two. And uh, as soon as you have your answers on a sheet of paper, I'll collect them. And uh, then we'll find out uh, how well you guys do. Is this made perfectly clear here? Um, you could take both sure things, pocket 5,000, um, or you could risk it both. And if you're right on both, you could pull in 12. Or not. All right, so the range of outcomes here is anywhere from 0 to 12,000. But there's a guaranteed 5,000 on the table if you want. OK, so if you guys are ready, go ahead and uh, pass these to the aisles. I'll collect them. So uh, do I have somebody that's just desperate to be the one to flip the coin? <laughs> I'm not going to be responsible for somebody's grade being up or down. So a uh, couple of quick things here with the uh, coin toss. you got to flip it over. It's got to turn over. you got to catch it and flip it on the arm. Yeah, no, it's complicated. That's the only way I can be sure it's completely randomized. That's important. Here we go. Yeah, just flip it up, catch it. That's good. Very nice. It's a heads. Anybody want to roll the die? There you go. Right off the board? Okay. It's a... Uh, Three. Anybody got three? All right. Now it's about it's, it's excitement there on the three. All right, so if you got heads and three that you pulled in, 12 grand right there. The whole point of this, though, is not so much to talk about who, who won or lost, but because of the way these gambles are constructed, I can tell you what type of person you are if you gamble a certain way. That's the neat part about this. All right, so let's look at the first gamble. All right, if you selected heads or tails, What's the expected value from choosing heads or tails? It's 3,000, right? There's a 50-50 chance that you're right, and 0.5 times 6,000 is 3,000. So your expected value of choosing heads or tails is higher than the, the sure thing. And therefore, that allows me to say, that if you chose the sure thing in the first gamble, that I know without a doubt that you are risk averse. All right? You were saying, fine, thank you. I want my $2,500. I'm not interested in the whole head tail thing. I'm willing to give up an expected value of an extra $500 to lock in some winnings. Okay? Now, down here, it's totally different. right? Down here, you can select any number along the die. And your expected value, if you choose a number, is what? It's only 1,000. right? It's a 1 in 6 chance out of 6,000. That's 1,000 dollars. Some people chose numbers in that case. And I'm absolutely convinced that they chose one of the numbers, that they were taking the 
bad gamble in order to enjoy the risk or the opportunity to make more. And so therefore, without any question, if you chose a number in the second gamble, you are a risk taker. All right? So that's the way you can differentiate between these two different groups. Uh, and that's why I wanted to show that to you.